smaller sitting, to be socially distant from one another, uh, as you know, we want to continue to do this, and the best way to do that is to, to follow some of the guidelines that we have set out. But uh, before we get into worship, would you just join me in a quick word of prayer? Uh, dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we have. I uh, thank you that we have this building that we're able to come to and worship you in, Lord. Uh, and I pray that uh, as we just start to focus on this morning, that even though things are still different, it's, it's not what we're used to, Lord, that ultimately this morning is still glorifying to you, to who you are, and that we are following the plans that you have set before us, and that we look for your guidance and not our own. And so this morning, I pray that uh, whatever we might have, the frustrations um, that we have throughout the week from work, from, from just maybe our country, our personal lives, whatever it might be, Lord, that we're just able to uh, set those up to you and just focus on you and praise you this morning. And again, I give glory to your name and all that you do and all that you continue to do in our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you are here with us, and we'd like to welcome those who are joining us uh, from home uh, via live stream. We're happy that you're here as well. Uh, I'd like to invite those who are here to stand as we uh, worship together this morning. Uh, so as we continue to look ahead as what is going on at our church, we are just going to continue uh, meeting here Sunday mornings at our 8.30, uh, 9.45, and 11 o'clock worship services. Uh, so again, we continue uh, to, to meet, and we hope that you're able to join us and that you feel comfortable enough to join us. But of course, if, if that is not an option, we have many of you watching at home, and that will continue to be an option as we go through this and as we continue to uh, improve on both in-person experience and also uh, at-home worship. Uh, but a way for that we... Uh, we can stay connected with you is that our connect cards uh, those are online they will be linked in the description uh, of course on Facebook and on YouTube uh, and then if you're here in person while we don't have the physical connect cards for you to fill out you can of course fill those out uh, if you have the app downloaded on your phone the St. John's app uh, you can do that there and then of course when you get home on the website you can fill it out there as well and this is just a way for us to stay connected with you we can know what's going on uh, in your life and have things to pray about you for uh, you know there's things that you just need uh, a group of people to come around you with prayer this of course is a great way uh, for that and then we also want to thank you that we have been able to continue operating at st john's our, our giving has still been great and we just thank that you uh, thankful that you have still been dedicated in that and uh, that's let us continue and build up our live stream services and, and make that a quality uh, production and if you're at home, you can give online at the link provided. If you're here, we do have a donation basket at the back that you can drop it off. We aren't coming around with offering plates, uh, just making this an easily uh, touchless uh, way to, to give. So uh, those are the things that we have coming up. Those are the ways that we can stay connected. And again, thank you for your continued giving uh, at our church. And before we get into uh, our message from Bill this morning, would you join me in prayer? 
Lord, again, I just want to give thanks this morning for all that you do. I want to give thanks for your guidance in our lives. I want to give thanks how you've reached out and, and personally touched each of us. You have a, a story for all of us to tell, one that you have set before us. And sometimes we can get frustrated. We can look out at the world. We can look at all these different directions. We can see all these negative things, Lord. But I just pray that we're able to remember who you are. We're able to remember the promises that you've made and the promises that you've kept. You are dedicated to us. You chase after us. You love us. And you never want to forsake us. We are the ones that might turn away and try to do our own thing. We focus on the wrong things. We focus on the things of this world. We focus on our sin, Lord. But you still want a relationship with us even after all of that. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning, it just be a morning where, again, our frustrations are left at home. The things that we, we see on the news, while they may frustrate us, the, the relationships that we have, they can frustrate us. Lord, this morning, I just want it to be one that is fully dedicated to you. And maybe this it, Sunday is the one where we can feel rejuvenated and go home and go back and preach your word to others. Many of us can feel burnout from having to uh, meet online or wear a mask while we're in service, Lord. But ultimately, again, we can push that to the side and we can give praise to your name that through all of this, through everything going on, Lord, you are greater and you will always be greater. Lord, as, as St. John's continues to navigate through this, I just pray that we continue to look to you, we continue to go to your guidance, we continue to go to your word. Because, Lord, what you offer is better than anything that we can come up with, any of our plans, any of our thoughts. Lord, they don't compare to what you have in store for us. So, Lord, as we continue to go through this, I just pray for the safety of everyone involved. I pray for our Church of St. John's. I pray for our community of Washington Township, our state of New Jersey, and, of course, our country and the world. That all of the decisions made throughout these things are just ones that are honoring you, and the ones that are making the decisions are going to you uh, in confidence. And so, Lord, for the rest of this morning, I just pray that we focus on you, we focus on your plan, and we focus on the ways that uh, we can continue to follow that. And Lord, I give thanks for what you've done what you're doing and all that you'll continue to do here at St. John's and of course in our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, yesterday, Tina and I traveled down to the beach and as we were driving down under all the clouds, Tina said, you know, today they said it was going to be the pick of the weekend, the best day. And we went and sat under the clouds with the occasional rain and complained about it the whole time. And then we got up this morning and realized yesterday was the pick of the weekend. Uh, all things are relative. <laughs> but the weatherman says the sun will come out tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. Um, tomorrow is a big day in our family, actually, because we're taking our baby girl to college. And um, Maddie is heading to Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I realized that, you know, many of you have been through that or something similar. Um, we actually, a few years ago, we took Emily to Montclair State up uh, in northern New Jersey, which was only a couple hours up the turnpike. Uh, but for us, this is the first time that it's more like five and a half hours. Um, it's, it's a greater distance, and so this is a whole new thing for us. Um, and so Maddie had this, this request that this summer that we spend time going through the Star Wars movies in story order. Um, as you know, there's many of them. And so um, we're down to two. So somewhere between now and tomorrow morning, we need to watch two Star Wars movies. So it could be a long night. Um, <laughs> but if you're familiar with the storyline, there's a, a relationship between two characters in Star Wars that's pretty significant to the plot line. And that's the relationship between Yoda and Luke Skywalker. And uh, we know this relationship because Obi-Wan sends uh, Luke to Yoda because uh, Luke is going to get training to be a Jedi. And he's, he needs to be trained by someone who uh, knows the Force and, and has the Force within him. And so he sends him to Yoda and uh, this, this wonderful relationship 
builds between these two characters in what we would call a mentorship. It's, uh, it's someone who's uh, teaching someone younger who's more inexperienced all that he has learned over the years from being a part of the force. And Hollywood has done a pretty good job over the years at giving us similar relationships to Yoda and, and Luke. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through all of them, but I think another one that many of us can remember, uh, which is pretty significant, is Daniel and Mr. Miyagi in Karate Kid, um, if my memory serves me correct. Uh, Daniel is being bullied and he, uh, he meets this Mr. Miyagi and he learns karate and he's able to defend himself. And so there's this great mentorship between these two characters throughout this movie, uh, Karate Kid. Now, these are fictional examples of mentorship. They, they are a part of a, a, a Hollywood storyline. Um, I think one that, that might bring it a little bit more home and closer to home and closer to today would be the real-life mentorship between Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, Steve Jobs is the, one of the co-founders of Apple, Mark Zuckerberg is the CEO uh, to Facebook, for Facebook. And um, I was reading a little bit about these two gentlemen, and, and Mark is, is pretty vocal about the fact that, you know, he learned so much from Steve Jobs in the area of uh, business and technology, and uh, he gives a lot of his success to his time spent learning from his mentor, Steve Jobs. And so we see these these relationships develop and we see that, you know, it's important for a young person who's looking to grow in a specific area to come alongside someone who has experience and who has a greater knowledge than they do. And today we're going to focus on the biblical example of Paul and Timothy. Paul and Timothy. Now we've been talking about Paul for the last several weeks. And one of the things that Paul was great at was being a mentor two young pastors, young people that he was bringing up during uh, his missionary journeys. And Timothy is, is the one that we read about so much in the New Testament. And so we're going to focus on the mentorship between Paul and Timothy this morning. I want to go to the beginning of their story, uh, which comes from Acts chapter 16. The first five verses uh, tell us about their initial relationship when Paul meets Timothy. Uh, hear these words. Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. And so uh, Paul thought it was important to have Timothy circumcised so that he would be able to connect more with the Jews throughout their time together. Um, he, they would know that he was the, the son of a Jewish uh, woman, and so it was important that he be circumcised. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered their decisions, reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches uh, were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. And you hear that phrase a lot in the book of Acts. In fact, I think... Um, I found eight references this week uh, where we hear how those early churches were strengthened in the faith and they grew daily in numbers. And then we move on to 1 Corinthians and we find in 1 Corinthians uh, that Paul sends Timothy to deal with some issues in the church. Uh, it says, for this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, and he really wasn't his son, but they had that kind of bond, that kind of father-son relationship who is faithful in the Lord, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. So Paul had a great respect for Timothy and the work that he was doing. And Paul wanted to continue to encourage Timothy. And he wanted his churches to know that Timothy was a person that if he came in his place, it was an okay thing. It was a good thing. Don't think of Timothy as, you know, the B team. That it's just as good as if I, Paul, were going to be there myself. And then in Philippians, we see that Paul sends Timothy to Philippi. And he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy, Timothy to you soon. Say that ten times fast. That I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. 
That says a lot about his relationship with Timothy. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So he wants the churches to know that that Timothy is coming. um, and, And if some of you don't like that, then know that I too hope to get there and be there for you in person. And then as we move on to 1 Thessalonians, we find right there in the beginning that um, Paul and Timothy were co-writers of First and uh, Second Thessalonians and uh, Philemon. And it says that in, in the, the scriptures. It says it as kind of a uh, subtitle there at the beginning of each of those books. But then there's something that comes specifically in uh, 1 Thessalonians 3.6 that's proof that Paul and Timothy were side by side. In this, uh, when uh, Paul writes, But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. And so that's proof that he's hearing uh, from Timothy from his visits uh, at the churches and he's writing about that in these letters. And so as we focus on this uh, relationship between Paul and Timothy, I wanted to find, (laughs) in in the midst of all of the examples, you know, what scripture, trying to hone in on one particular portion of scripture that that really fleshes out what this mentorship looks like. And how do we summarize all that that Paul is is passing along to Timothy? And I I came to 1 Timothy chapter 4 which is the, the text that I've chosen for this morning. Now, I'm, I want to read to you, and I want you to follow along. This is all of chapter 4. They're not long chapters um, in First and Second Timothy. Um, but I want you to listen carefully to these words of wisdom that Paul is passing along to Timothy. Uh, here we go, beginning of chapter 4. The Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits, and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but... Godliness has value of all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which has given you through prophecy when the body of the elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now I want to take a little little bit of time here this morning to, to dig into a couple of the phrases in that scripture. First, he says in the beginning that some will abandon their faith. And I think right off the bat, this is an important phrase. 
Because you can, you can read that and think it means that people will just stop believing. They'll abandon their faith altogether. That's not what he's saying here. This is a key phrase in what's going on in the church at this moment. He's saying here that, that some will choose to abandon the faith that they've been taught and put their faith in something else. And so uh, at this moment, he's talking about how um, there, it, there are people who are starting to believe false doctrine. False doctrine is being preached and taught. And there are people who are buying into this. And so they're abandoning their faith. Um, in Acts 14, we read that, that the, they're strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. That's the sound doctrine of the faith as they've learned it. And then he talks about deceiving spirits. And this goes back to, uh, all the way back to the book of Genesis, where Satan appears as a serpent and convinces Adam and Eve that it's okay to eat the fruits. It'll open your eyes and you'll, you'll be just like God. False doctrine was entering the church. Scripture was being used to justify sin. And preaching God's word had a hidden agenda. And then he goes on to, to say that their consciences, that he talks about these hypocritical liars whose consciences would have been seared as with a hot iron. During this time, criminals were branded on their skin with a hot iron. So there was a visible sign that they were a criminal. This is not something visible, but something internal, that their consciences would be seared as with a hot iron because of their teachings. And he talks about the legalistic teachings and the idea that there's rules that have to be followed, which completely leaves out the personal relationship with Jesus. And so Paul writes in Romans that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God wants us to look at all that he provides as blessings. And, and they're blessings that come directly from him that we should be thankful for. He settles that, that debate in a dream of Peter's in Acts chapter 10. Peter talks about a dream in, in Acts 10 that where a white sheet was laid before him and animals of various varieties were put on the white sheet. And he heard a voice say, kill and eat. And Peter's taken back by that. Because it doesn't make sense to him that it's okay for him to just go ahead and eat something that's unclean. And then the voice says, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And after that, Paul goes on in this chapter to, to give Timothy some specific instructions as a preacher. Not just in the context of a Paul mentoring a preacher, but Paul discipling a young man to live a life that's worthy of sharing his experience and the gospel with others. And so first he says, train yourself to be godly. Stay in the word. Seek godliness in all that you do. Don't get caught up in the false doctrine and the godless things of the world. Godliness has both present and future value. The good teaching that he talks about here is the, the very faith on which their ministry and witness was focused. And he stresses the importance of developing spiritual health as well as physical health. Because ultimately, it all points back to Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross for everyone. But Paul reminds Timothy that the death and the resurrection of Jesus would only impact those who would come to him in faith believing. And so he says, the next line, put your hope in the living God. And then he says, command and teach. Even at your age, Timothy, use your knowledge and your experience in the faith to teach what you have learned in such a way that others will follow. I connect with this line because... I, I became a leader in the church at a very young age. I was directing the choir and I was the worship committee chairman in my teens. So I knew what it was like to try to convince people who were much older than me that I knew what I was talking about. And so I had to, I had to do it with confidence 
and <laughs> um, then outside of the church, I remember when I, I started to, to direct in theater outside of church, again, I was a, the young guy who was, you know, trying to direct all these older people who had much more experience uh, in the theater than I did, and so I had to speak with confidence. And what I found with over the years, you know, here I am and here they are, is <laughs> that gap got smaller until suddenly I was older than they were. And so I was saying, hey, these punks think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> so I understand what it means to have that, you know, if you're younger and you're in a leadership position, that you need to do it with confidence. And so he says, command and teach. And then he goes on to say, set an example in your speech, in the way you love, in the way you do life, through your faith, through your purity. His sole purpose was to encourage Timothy to continually share the gospel and live a life as an example. Ultimately, that example should point back to Christ and what he had done on the cross. And then the last one, he says, give yourself wholly to them. Now, at that particular moment, he he's first says, be diligent in these matters and then give yourself wholly to them, referencing all of the things that he's uh, talked to Timothy about. But he also wants him to give himself wholly to the people that he's teaching and he's preaching. He wants, uh, he wants him to focus on them, like Paul has focused on Timothy in this mentorship relationship. He wants him to be present with the people that he's with. Remain firm in his teachings of the faith. And watch as lives change as you grow closer and you grow closer to the Lord. And so this concept of mentoring is what we call in the church discipling. It's, it's discipleship. It's Jesus uh, teaching his disciples in the ways of the kingdom so that they too would make disciples by teaching others as Jesus taught them. And so when we come alongside someone and teach them not just the basics of the faith, but how it plays out in life, we're in that discipleship relationship. And as I was studying that over the course of the last couple of weeks and thinking about my own uh, experience with this, I, I, it, it forces you to think about your own faith and where your faith is at this point in your life. And it makes you think about the experiences that you've been through, that your faith has brought you through. And you begin to realize that you're in a place where you can share with someone who's young in their faith. And, and all that you share and all of your experience can be an example to them, can be something that encourages them and brings them up to have a stronger relationship. It's the idea of mentoring in such a way to build the kingdom and encourage others in their faith. Because mentoring passes on Christ's example from one person to another. Paul never said it, but I believe his motto was 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Jesus was a mentor to his disciples who were called then to make disciples. Now, recently I participated in a men's mentoring group and we based our time together on a, a book by Reggie Campbell called Mentor Like Jesus. And, and he referred to it as radical mentoring. And this quote comes from Reggie's uh, book, where he said, mentoring is about showing someone how to be something. It's about becoming a learner and follower of Jesus Christ, because that's what makes our Father, our Heavenly Father, most pleased. But then he goes on to say that he has a life purpose statement and when I read his life purpose statement, I thought this should be a life purpose statement for all believers. Look at it. Uh, and you can put your name in there. I, Reggie Campbell. I, Bill Yerkes. Glorify God by loving and serving others, by changing them to be all they can be and to give all of themselves to Jesus Christ. When I think about, you know, like the relationship between Mark Zuckerberg and Steve Jobs, you know, that, that was, that's a... a a worldly example of a mentorship 
where they understand that what they're doing for each other is not helping each other out, but it's helping the world out, the, the world of business out. You know, business is going to mean something more for Apple and for Facebook and, and, you know, anything they can do to bring someone else up in the business. When we as believers are discipling one another or mentoring one another, we're building the kingdom. We're bringing up others and encouraging others in their faith. And so I came across another writer who talks about Christian mentoring in a publication. Her name was Gail Ashmore, and I love how she put this. It's a practice set up by God that allows people not just to experience the teachings of Jesus, but rather participate in them. I love that. And so Paul mentored Timothy because of his desire to see the truth of the gospel continually preached in the church. The truth of the gospel continually preached in the church. Because Paul knew that false doctrine was infiltrating the church and he wanted to counter it with truth from God's word. The mentoring relationship exemplifies what it means to disciple a brother or sister in the faith. The sole purpose in discipleship is to point others to Christ and equip them to grow in their knowledge of Christ and in their own faith journey. This whole series has been about what Paul has left to the world. What, what he did uh, during his lifetime and, and throughout his ministry was developing disciples who would carry on the message and, and the mindset for years beyond his time on earth. His ministry focus was preaching the word and empowering others to continue to spread it. He took it upon himself to see to it that his death wouldn't be the death of the gospel. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that he felt that it was his burden alone. But he did this because it should be the mentality of all believers that we carry with us. And that we seek to help others and mentor others and disciple others so that they might experience the same grace and salvation that we have experienced. Another big name in leadership is John Maxwell. And in his book, Mentoring 101, he um, quotes Douglas Lawson, we exist temporarily through what we take, but we live forever in what we give. I love that. And so... I took chapter 4 of 1 Timothy and I thought these words and, and, and this moment where he's mentoring uh, Timothy is no different than where we are today. It's the same problems that we deal with in the church today. We're dealing with all the same struggles that, that leaders and teachers and preachers and new believers in the church back then dealt with. And I looked at this chapter 4 and I thought, we could put this into today's context. It's just as meaningful today as it was back then. So I, re I paraphrase chapter 4 as if I were reading it or writing it to someone younger than I. And because Paul and Timothy kind of set up this father-son example, I'm choosing my son Andrew. And so I wrote chapter 4 to Andrew. Andrew. You need to understand not everyone is going to believe how we believe. Some will try and convince you their words are true and their way of life is acceptable. Be sure and understand the difference Jesus brought to the teachings of the Old Testament and the redemption that only he can provide. Come alongside your friends and family and encourage them in the faith and knowledge that you have gained in your walk with the Lord. When you have questions about what you hear from myths and rumors, seek God's word for answers. It is important to be physically healthy, but your spiritual health will guide you through life and into eternity. My parents taught me, as I have taught you, to put your hope in the Savior of the world, the living God. Never be afraid to share, even at your young age. It is never too early to be an example in how you talk to people, and how you show your love, and how you demonstrate your faith. Use your talents to serve the Lord so others may see and hear what God has done. And those who you do life with will be witness to your faithfulness and perseverance, and some will come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of you. 
Two-thirds of our mission statement here at St. John's are to connect with God and each other. It's not just about making connections. It's about making disciples. It's not just about being in relationships, but investing in them. And it's not just about what we take, but what we give. I believe if Paul were here today, that he wouldn't be too happy with us. Because all we've been doing is spending time talking about Paul. And Paul never wanted it to be about him. And it's evident because when we talk about Paul, ultimately it points back to Jesus. And that is something that Paul would have wanted from his ministry. That is why Paul spent so much time being a mentor. Last week, Eddie shared with us that uh, the, the very heart of Paul's theology was based on solus Christus, Christ alone. The life and ministry of the apostle leads us back to Jesus. And so, is God calling you this morning to go deeper with someone? Is God calling you to be a mentor to someone? Or is God calling you to be mentored so that together we can grow closer to Jesus who calls us to go and make disciples? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to not only come together and worship you through our our music and through our prayers but to take this time to open your word and see what you have for us today and see how relevant it is to where we are today. That we don't have to feel like you're a a God who is distant from us during these unusual times, but you are a God who is still speaking to us and still reaching out to us. That we might learn how to be better disciples of yours here on earth, especially at a time when people are seeking and searching for the truth. We hold the truth from your word, Lord God. And so convict us and show us ways that we can be better disciples for you, that others might be encouraged in the faith and might come to a saving knowledge in Jesus Christ. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we continue to worship. life, one of the last things he says to Luke Skywalker is, pass on what you have learned. And it's interesting, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul is certain that his death is near. 
And so he's giving some parting words to Timothy. And if you look up those parting words in um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, the message translation is, pass on what you have heard from me. And so, <laughs> I don't believe Yoda was quoting scripture necessarily there, but I just thought it was ironic how um, it has a similar translation. And that's what we're called to do, to pass on what we have learned. I'm excited about this idea of mentoring, and I think it's something that ultimately can grow the church, the church universal, and can bring revival to the church if we just take the time to come alongside others and nurture them in their faith. Um, if you want to talk more about that, uh, I would love to hear from you through email or through uh, phone conversation. We're talking about mentoring groups and getting uh, people in a place where they can mentor and be mentored. So if that's something that you've been praying about or you want to begin praying about, please reach out. I'd love to talk to you about that possibility. Thanks for coming this morning and have a great week.